Welcome everyone to NetDevops Live. We are here in season two, talk nine, and we are talking about DNA Center, Cisco DNA Center applications. Joining us today is Adam Radford, live from Hong Kong. So we thank Adam for joining us. It's such a terrible hour for him, but we appreciate him bringing all of his knowledge and experience on Cisco DNA Center to us. As always, if you have any questions during today's session, please use the Q&A panel. We'll be uh, monitoring and answering questions throughout today's session. And if you're looking for the webinar resources, the slides, sample code, um, links to the learning labs and other resources, we, we already have them posted in the webinar resources up on the website. And I'll drop a link to that in the chat momentarily. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Adam to share his screen and take us away. Hey, thanks, Hank. Really appreciate that. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Um, and welcome to the, the session talking about Cisco DNA Center um, platform API. So um, I am going to assume that most people are familiar with Cisco DNA Center. It's been out for a little while now. Um, but just in case you're not, um, and just to, to cover what we're going to, to go across today, we're going to talk about the concept of DNA Center Platform. So you're probably aware of Cisco DNA Center, um, but there is this thing called Platform that is um, associated with it, and that's the way or the means with which we're exposing um, northbound APIs amongst other things. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of, of Platform, why we did it, what it's for. Um, just give you a, a little bit of an overview of how to get started and then we're going to get into the meat of the presentation, look at the different types of applications and then um, give you some examples of, of APIs, examples of, um, of applications that you can write and then um, some next steps. So Cisco DNA Center, um, obviously it's our controller for the campus. Um, it controls wired and wireless infrastructure, routers as well. And really the whole point of DNA Center was to try and abstract and simplify the way that we interact with the network. So there were two main problems that network engineers have um, in a campus environment. One is how do you make changes to the network? Um, so this whole notion of intent and policy is really about how we simplify the amount of change that um, gets done to the network. And then the other thing that we, we need to know is we need to understand what's going on to the, in the network at, at any point in time. So how we understand that the health of devices, how we take um, all of the telemetry, all of the pieces of information that we can collect around network devices and users and user experience, and then how we can correlate, aggregate and simplify that and tie that down um, or create some sort of insight into to network performance. So the next question is, you know, what is this thing called platform? Um, if you look at the architecture of DNA Center, it's a Kubernetes-based um, microservice architecture, container architecture. So everything is just exposed through a set of internal REST APIs, so a whole bunch of different microservices. Uh, there's about 128 of them, I think, um, running on the, the, the controller. Um, one of those services is actually the user interface, and all it really does is just interact with those um, northbound APIs and just makes API calls into the, the underlying services. So when you, you look at the, the user interface of DNA Center, um, essentially all that is doing is just calling internal APIs. Now, Platform is another piece of software. It's another set of services that, that exists alongside the user interface, and its role is to uh, abstract and simplify those internal APIs and make them easier for people to consume because a lot of the internal APIs are written around the UI and are written around the, the internal da data structures that don't necessarily make sense outside of, of DNA Center. So really the, the whole point behind this is that we can simplify the schema in terms of the parameters that you need to provide and the information that comes back. And we can also do some interesting things like provide composite APIs where something like creating a new wireless LAN um, typically would involve creating wireless profiles, creating wireless SSODs, uh, making provisioning changes to WLCs and access points, assigning them potentially to locations. But all of that can be done now with a, a single simple uh, composite API call. So the other thing that you need to know is that the platform APIs have a different prefix. 
it'll be slash DNA slash intent. Um, there is rate limiting on these endpoints, so you may notice um, some rate limiting messages if you uh, try and um, send too many queries. And then the other thing about platform is that it's also used for east-west integration into things like IT service management tools like ServiceNow, um, uh, IP address management, and there's some other interesting things we're doing around tying into security and other, other types of services. But essentially, the point behind platform is it's a way of getting access to these APIs in a, in a more consumable way. So how do you get started? Um, the first thing is that in order to enable, the, the platform package gets installed by default um, on DNA Center, but you do need to enable the REST APIs because by default they are turned off. So in order to do this, if you have access to a DNA Center, you need to go into platform You'll notice this platform tab. This is only available to the admin user, so that's the other point to, to be aware of. And then there is this concept of bundles. So inside um, platform, there are a bunch of different things that uh, platform or services that platform provides. So the DNA Center REST APIs is the one that you want to turn on to get access to the REST APIs. Um, one of the other ones that we will cover is network events. Um, I'll talk about that later on. And you can see here that we've also got some integration into ServiceNow. So things like CMDB integration, um, network issue integration, SWIM or uh, software image management or software upgrade in integration to ServiceNow. So those issues and um, SWIM events, we have uh, both a ServiceNow integration as well as a open REST API integration. So you can do your own integration. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, so it's important that you uh, you enable that, and then once you do that, you should have access to the, the APIs. Um, in terms of what APIs are available, if you go into Develop Toolkit, click on APIs, you'll see there's a catalog of APIs. Um, the nice thing about this is that you can click on the API, you get documentation around the API, um, the schema, for example, that it's going to return. Um, but there's also this uh, very handy thing, try it out, uh, which will allow you to make the, the REST API call live on a, uh, a live system. And unfortunately, I've chosen one that is going to require a timestamp. So let me use another one where I don't have to do that. Um, let me just look at the site hierarchy API, for example. So what you're seeing is actually 1.3. So if you're running a 1.2.10 DNAC, you'll notice that the site hierarchy API is not there, for example. So this is one of the new APIs that was added in, um, in 1.3. But essentially what you see here is I get um, the output back. I can type, I use parameters if I need to, so I can um, test any API that I, I need to on box. So it's a very simple way of getting started. I can also generate code if I want to. So there's a code review. I can select a language. I like Python and it will generate very simple um, Python code that I can cut and paste and reuse. So that's how you can get started. Um, obviously, you notice that the thing that I didn't do there was authenticate. Um, and actually, before I get onto that, we also publish these APIs, developer.cisco.com. So if you don't have access to a DNA center, um, then there's a couple of things you can do. One is the, the APIs are available on developer.cisco.com. There's also Sandbox DNAC. Um, that is available as well. So that's an always on sandbox. There's actually two of them. Um, you can log into this directly. Um, DevNet user is the username Cisco123 with a capital C and exclamation mark is the password. And that will get you into um, a DNA center that you can try out. Now this one is only running 126. Uh, it needs to be updated. Um, there's a, D a Sandbox DNA C2 that is running 1.2.10 um, and we'll get that upgraded to 1.3 to in the very near future. So that's the APIs. Um, the next big thing is authentication. Um, the main thing that you need to understand here is that the authentication is a basic auth um, using username and password that is going to return a token. 
Now what you need to do is you need to capture the, the output of this token um, and then you need to use this as a header in all of the other API calls that you make. So it'll be the XAuth token um, header and then essentially you need to paste in the, um, the body of this token as the, the, the value that you provide. Now there are four roles on DNAC. So um, typically, you know, admin, super admin role um, will allow you to access anything. If you want to provide an observer role and a number of customers um, want to provide some access to some of the APIs, so all of the read-only APIs, all of the gets, um, you can assign to a, an observer role and they will be able to authenticate the token that they get will only allow them to, to um, access the get APIs essentially. Um, I did mention rate limiting. Um, if you exceed the rate limiting, you'll get a, a message, you'll get an error message back. Um, the rate limiting varies per endpoint. Um, it's anywhere between five and 100 per minute. So obviously five per minute is not a lot. Um, there's some work that we're doing around expanding that. We've been very conservative with the rate limiting um, for various reasons, but that will be, that will be changing in the future. Um, it's also displayed in on-box documentation so you know in advance um, what the rate limiting is for the particular endpoint that you're looking at. Okay, so let's look at some of the, uh, the types of applications. Um, I've broken them down into to three buckets. Uh, one is around visibility, so the concept of assurance and, and understanding what's going on on the network. Um, the other is around notifications and events. So when there is a, a network issue, when there is some sort of issue that DNAC is uh, reported, how you can get access to that event if you're not using ServiceNow, if you want to use your own uh, eventing framework, and that's very easy to do. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about automation, which is how we can make change to the network. So uh, if you follow some of my other presentations, I've spoken a lot about the automation piece in the past, um, and I really want to focus a little bit more on the, the assurance visibility and the event notification piece this time around. So what is assurance? Um, assurance is really a way of understanding the health of the network. Um, we've broken it down into two components. We've got this notion of um, network device health, which is a network admin or a network operator. I care about the CPU memory, packet loss, etc., on network devices. As a user of the network, I don't care about any of that, all I care about is how quickly can I get onto the network and what's my experience like once I do. So the, the user health is really based on how well the user devices, be wired or wireless, are connecting to the network. And then the network health is how well the, the network devices of various categories are, are performing. So this is a, a look at the current assurance APIs. So we have this concept of site health, so we can give you an understanding of per location, uh, what the health of devices and users is at a particular location. Um, we can also break that down into client health and network health and give you a global view of all of the wired and wireless um, clients, how well they're performing and give you KPIs where clients fail um, their health score. And similarly for network devices, we can give you that global view. Um, then we can give you specific information for a specific client and we can give you detailed information for a specific network device. So in order to, to show those, um, if I take a look at my um, DNA center, if I look at the, the assurance page, you'll see that the network device health I have here, I've got one router that's very healthy. I've got five access um, devices, access switches. I've got a wireless LAN controller and I've got a bunch of access points. Um, obviously this is kept over a time period. So I'm just showing you the last 24 hours. I could show you the last seven days. And you'll notice here that this health line will adjust and reflect the last seven days as does the, the user health. So I've got this notion of health over an extended time period. And that's one very useful um, part of this is that all of the information is being recorded. Uh, it's almost like a network black box. It's a black box recorder for your network because I'm recording everything about the network for um, two weeks. I'm showing you seven days. I can go back um, two weeks and I can show you the last seven days. Now, if I look uh, down into the devices, um, I get a bunch more information 
around those devices, around which devices are performing well or not. Um, again, you can see this trend line. Um, I can see the number of devices and I get a breakdown of, of device types, access points, etc. So there's a whole lot of information that I have around devices um, and you know, how healthy they are, how well they're performing. Similarly for users, um, I get access to the same sort of thing. So if I go to client health, I will see the, the health of, of user devices and you'll, you'll get to see the long-term trend. You can see that that's 24 hours. I can go seven days if I want to. Um, and I had just filtered something here, so that's why I'm not seeing the wild. Um, you notice that I don't see any wireless, and the reason for that is that I had applied a filter because I was looking at the um, a particular location. So if I wanted to, I could drill down into a particular location. Uh, the way that this is organized is that all of the devices are part of a location, and then I can get a health score per location. If I have a look at this, I can see um, this is a summary health score for all of the sites that I have. I've got Sydney site that's got um, a single client. I've got the Perth site that's got a bunch of wireless clients and similarly with wireless devices. Uh, to try and show you how easy this is to use, there's um, a little set of tools that I've written um, and it's in the GitHub repository that I, I um, will share with you later. It's called Assurance, uh, funnily enough. And this is just an educational script just to show you um, that sort of information and how to get access to it. So when I run that script, um, it's showing me the API call that I made. Um, it's showing me then a formatted version of the data. So essentially what I've done is I've looked at the site health. I've got the site health, I've got any issues, I've got the router health, the access health, the client health and the client count um, for each of those locations. I've then looked at client health and the way that this works is it looks at the health score for all of the wired and wireless clients and gives me a breakdown of how many good, um, fair, poor, idle, no data or new clients I have for wired and wireless. And you notice this thing called a timestamp. I'll come back to that in a sec. And when I tried to make that earlier API call, I needed to have a timestamp. Um, I didn't have that. But essentially, that's the thing that allows me to go back in time. So I can look at the health of the network now. I can look at it yesterday. I can look at it five days ago. I can go back in time if I want to. Um, the other thing that I show you here is that if there is a client that has poor health, I try and root cause it. So this particular client has an issue with DHCP. So it's not able to DHCP successfully. That's why the, the health score is so poor. Um, if I scroll down and I look at the network health, um, essentially what I'm doing here is breaking down all of the devices and all of those devices are healthy. Um, they all have a, a very good score. So no, no uh, KPIs have been violated. So those um, first three APIs that I showed you set of APIs are all available in that script. So it's just a very easy way of, of, uh, of getting started and just some examples of how you can, um, you can use, the, or use the APIs. Um, if you use the script, you'll notice a couple of other things that you can do. Um, you can provide a particular timestamp to go back and forward in time. Um, you can also get the raw output so one of the things that I found is useful is to show you uh, all of the possible fields and attributes that you get um, for each of the API calls. So for example, I just showed you a very small view of a site. Um, but if you look at what I get for sites, I get um, the healthy percentage, I get the wireless percentage, the number of clients, the number of network devices. There's a whole range of things around, you know, routers, wireless, switches, distribution, um, total number of connected um, clients. I give you good wired clients. So there's a whole range of uh, pieces of information that you get that you could uh, take advantage of. 
Um, you'll notice also that there's application health here. Um, that hasn't been enabled yet. That's in um, EFT at the moment, but you'll also get access to application health scores in the future. Um, the other thing, if you look at the client information, that is quite detailed. So I give you each of the client types, um, all of the scores, the count, unique clients. So we are differentiating between total clients and unique clients. Um, that's a new change that we've made. And there's a whole range of um, information that we give you around these health scores and, and root causes, etc. So there's a lot of information here that you can look at. And remember that everything that you've seen here, you can look at a particular point in time um, over the last two weeks. So scrolling down to network devices, similar sort of thing here. You've got a, a bunch more information around the health scores. Um, you've got the categories, etc., and the distribution. So just a lot more information. I, I just chose to, to use this uh, to show a summary. Um, of course, I can get details around a particular device. Um, so for example, if I was after this particular wireless LAN controller, then I can use the device detail API. So that was the one that I was alluding to here. So I've got client detail and device detail. So this is just showing me that um, this wireless LAN controller tells me the version of code. Um, it gives me the health score. So it's got a health score of 10. Um, but if I wanted to, I could actually get a bunch more. I could look at the raw information that I get back. If Again, if I give it the dash raw option, um, that will show you all of the things that I can, I can see. So I can see when it was last reset. I can see that it's not actually HA. Um, I can see that it's successfully being um, connected to by DNAC. And then I've got you know, information around the, the health score, the memory, um, and uh, its location. I can do a similar sort of thing for a user. So if I particular, pick a particular user, um, this shows me all of the information around uh, this particular Mac. And I know that it is a wireless device. Um, it's 2.4 gig, it's on channel six. It's connected to the enterprise SSID. I can see it's received signal strength. Um, I know that the user is Brad health score is 10 and then I can see that it's connected to this particular access point running this version of code that is a health score of 10 but that's the access point that connects to the wireless LAN controller. Um, again if I was to look at the raw information for a, a client there's a lot of information here so you get to see information around um, the links so where it's connected to you get to see information around um, onboarding. So I can see the amount of time that it took to, to onboard the device. I can see the transmit receive bytes. I can see DNS requests and responses. I can see signal to noise. There's a whole heap of extra information that I can get around a client in particular. So there's an awful lot of information that um, you have available around getting access to client detail and client detail information. And bear in mind um, that when I make, uh, when I ask for this by default, it just gets the last five minutes, but I could actually get this information for this client at any point in time. So this is really useful for troubleshooting um, scenarios where people have a problem Friday afternoon and then don't tell you till Monday morning. Now, the one challenge that exists with this is that um, I go from a very high level in terms of site health, the overall client health and the overall network health. Um, so that's showing me you know, sort of this information, but then it's very difficult for me to get down to the, the actual real list of clients. So for me to get to the list of clients is actually quite hard. I, how do I know what the valid clients are? And the answer today is that there is actually no official API to do that. Um, actually, before I go there, I just want to cover a little bit around the timestamp. So you'll notice that the timestamp I've used and the way that I've done this is that I've, I've given you the timestamp um, 
which is the one that is basically now. Um, and that will appear in each of the API calls. So this particular timestamp is the one that I just used. Now that's called uh, milli epochs. And the reason that that's important is that epoch obviously is when Linux was or Unix was born. Um, and that's the number of seconds since uh, 1970, January the 1st. So if I take this time and insert, or this timestamp and insert it, it's giving me Tuesday, May the 28th at 2 p.m. Uh, but in my time zone, it's actually 12.32 in the morning. So it's done the, the translation, so it's about an hour ago. That's interesting because I think there's a time zone issue there, if that's the case. Because according to my clock, it's one o'clock in the morning, but I'm in Hong Kong, so who knows, it's two hours different. Anyway, you get the point, it's, um, it's done the, the translation for me. So it's important to be able to do that translation. Um, so January 1st, 1970 is zero. Um, one second afterward would be um, 001. And then if I look at 28th of May, that would be a very large number, but we're actually looking at milli epochs. So you, you multiply by a thousand. So essentially, if you do a time now in Python um, and get the, the number of seconds in epoch, you need to multiply it by a thousand and that will give you um, the timestamp in milli epochs. And of course, if you want to go back five minutes, which is quite easy to do, that's 300,000 milli epochs that you would take off and you would see the, the, um, the information from five minutes ago. So how to get access to hosts. So what I've done is there's some unofficial APIs um, that I have documented. Um, there's a little script that shows you how to use them. Um, I need to add some more parameters into that, but at least to get started. And essentially this gives you all of the information about um, the host that DNAC knows. So, you know, when I try to go from, you know, client health, and I see that there are four clients that have a poor health score, how do I know which four clients have a poor health score? Well, I can use the host API to find that out. So this works a little bit differently to the way that you'd expect. Um, the fundamental difference is that it should be a get, but it's actually a post. So the way the API is constructed is it's a post request. So that's the first thing. Um, and then you obviously need to provide a body for that post request. You can get away with nothing. So if you just put square um, curly brackets, so just an empty JSON dictionary, that will be okay. Um, that won't have any filters. I'll talk a little bit about filters later on, but um, if you just do that, that will be enough to, to basically just dump the host table. So in order to show you how that works, um, I wrote a little script called all hosts, or all clients, sorry, all clients. I should probably call it all hosts. Um, so what this does is it just dumps that table um, and essentially I can see the ID, the host type, the host name, the health score, IP address location, SSID, link speed, if applicable. Um, again, I've given you the ability to do the dash raw option that shows you everything that you know about a host or a client. And this is quite useful because this shows me for a particular device, I can see whether it's connected to the network or not. So in this case, it's actually disconnected. Um, this type of device is um, a client sensor. And the reason that it's disconnected is that the way the wireless sensors work is that they run a test every now and again, and then they basically idle out or time out from the network. So its health score is, is poor because it's actually not con physically connected to the network. I see auth type, I see the VLAN, I see SSID, if it was um, SDA that we're talking about, I would see the VNID, channel, frequency, you know, all the, the information that you'd expect. Um, I get that globally. Um, I can see another, where's a better one? If I just scroll up here, I'll see a better one. So this one is connected, it's got a health score of 
of 10. It's a Linux workstation. It's actually a Raspberry Pi. Um, should be able to work that out from that. Um, user ID of the person who's authenticated. It's WPA2 auth. Um, so again, it's a, you know, it gives me all of the information about all of the clients. Now, the other thing that you can do is you can filter this. So for example, you can filter start and stop time. So I can look for all clients that were connected um, at a particular point in time. The simplest filter I could do is to get all clients for a particular location. So this particular filter, even though it's not obvious from the type ID list, and remember I said this was an internal API and not really meant for external um, consumption. Um, this is actually the site ID of the site that I was interested in. And if I use that filter, then it will only display the, the clients in that particular site. So if the Sydney site had poor health, had clients with poor health scores, then I would be able to just look for the, the clients in Sydney. Similarly, I can um, look at things like start time, end time. So look at all of the clients between a certain period. I can um, use pagination. So I can provide an offset and a limit. So if there's 500, then I can just get the first 25, for example. And in this particular case, I'm getting the dev type wide, but I could also do other things where I looked for um, all of the clients that had a particularly um, poor health score. So I've got a choice in terms of how I do that. Um, there is a similar uh, API, again, internal, again, unofficial, again, will change, but at least to give you access to the information and the health scores about potential um, devices that have issues. Um, you can use this internal API. So start time, end time are mandatory. So that's the only thing that you need to know. You need to have a start and end time. You can get away with an empty body as before, and then you'll get you know, a bunch of information about the device. You'll get the health scores, etc. cetera. Um, and there are other filters that you can add. So you can add on, I don't think I gave an example yet, but you, you can add on um, site as before, you can add on status. There's a whole range of things that you can add into the, um, the health score or the, the filters. So again, um, there's a little example here. So if I look at all network devices, um, that's going to, shows me the API call. It's dumped out a bunch of parameters. Um, notice here that it's also given me the metrics. I need to produce up a little bit, but basically it's given me all of the metrics that it has for the device. So the memory, CPU. Um, for access points, it gives me some interesting things. It gives me air quality, which is based on clean air, um, and it gives me interference as well. So I get um, utilization, interference, I get air quality. So I get a bunch of extra things um, around these metrics, um, which I need to tidy up in terms of how I display, but that's kind of useful, particularly for access points. Um, again, dash dash raw will show you the raw payload. Um, so this is just showing you all of the, the things that I can get, or all of the attributes I can get access to. Um, you notice down the bottom here, this is the pagination. So it, it does tell me the, the page size and the offset and the total. So I, I would know if I asked for 25, I would then know that there were 50 total because the total count would be 50. Um, the offset would be zero. It would give me the first um, 25 and then I'd be able to get the next 25 to, to get the 50. So I can, I can manage how um, quickly I, and what chunks I get the, those um, results. Okay, so that's um, a bit about the, the APIs for getting access to the, the health information. Um, there's a bunch of use cases for this. Um, one of the ones I've been working on is a store manager dashboard that basically looks at a particular location and looks at all of the particular types of devices and then gives the store manager an understanding of you know, how well the, the environment is working. So based on all of those different devices, whether it's a scanner, security camera, register, etc., I know how many devices are healthy and I've got the average health score of the ones that are, that, that are healthy. Um, and then if something, if some devices are not working properly, so in this particular case, guess Wi-Fi isn't working, then I can notify the, the store manager that there's a problem with a particular service. So that's a very simple example of how you can, you can use some of this information 
to provide a very different view from the, the network centric view that uh, the DNAC provides. Um, the other thing I want to talk about was issues because when we collect all of these metrics, uh, the next thing we do is we work out whether there is a problem and if there is a problem, what the likely root cause is. So there's about 200 or so issues that we, we recognize in, in DNAC today. Now, the thing about those issues is they get generated automatically um, and most people don't want to have to have someone log into DNAC, go to the, the top 10 issues and see if there are any issues or view all of the issues and then go through the issue page to see if there's a problem on the, the network. What they'd like to be able to do is to have some sort of notification that there are some issues and they'd like to be able to have those issues um, sent via some other mechanism for handling. So for example, you know, on this particular controller, there's been a bunch of DHCP issues, a bunch of client onboarding issues, um, you know, some interface flapping issues, some NTP issues. So I've got a couple of devices that or one in particular that has an issue with NTP. So it, it would be useful to be able to get access to that information. So I mentioned before that there were other integrations that we had, um, and I specifically mentioned the network events for REST API endpoint. So that, sits, that bundle sits just below DNA Center REST API. Um, that is the way that I can um, publish those issues to just a REST um, a, a webhook. So just a REST API input endpoint, it's just a webhook. Um, it's very easy to write uh, one of those and I'll show you an example of one that I prepared earlier. Um, but what I want to show you is how you set this up. So essentially you need to enable the uh, network events. So it's active, so I've already enabled it. So that's the first thing. Um, the next thing that you need to do is you need to configure the endpoint itself. So that's under general settings. Um, and you'll notice that I've configured a REST endpoint for um, publishing events. So I can add one. It's very easy to do. All I need to do is give it a name and a description. It does need to be HTTPS. So that's one thing that you do need to, to know. And then you can just put in a name or an IP address. You have to put in a username and password, but you don't have to enforce it. So for example, I, if I wasn't authenticating that endpoint and I hadn't turned authentication on, then it doesn't matter what I put in here, it won't matter. But obviously if I had authenticated the, um, the webhook, then it would matter. Um, once you've done that, um, you then need to um, schedule the um, event or the, the, the publishing. Now, this is something that is temporary. It's going away in 1.4. Um, but today, the way that it works internally is that DNAC actually runs a job every 15 minutes to see if there are network events and then it publishes them. So it's not a pure subscription uh, method today. The beauty of this though is that when we do move to a subscription model, nothing should change in your code in terms of how you handle the events. It's just that you'll get them as they occur rather than potentially 15 minutes afterwards, worst case. But you do need to set up the schedule. Um, you can have it recurring. The, the smallest window is 15 minutes. Um, you can also set a start and end time, but most people just set it and, and forget it. And then the final thing you need to do is under configurations, you need to configure events themselves. So by default, they won't be ticked. And what you need to do is select all of the events that you want to be sent off and enable them to be sent through. So a little example of how you could use that. Um, again, this code is available on um, GitHub, but there's a little um, webhook server that I wrote um, that you can spin up. And then because the um, because the events only happen every 15 minutes, it's kind of difficult to, to simulate. So I wrote a little sample client that's got some dummy um, configurations in. So if you just run it um, by itself, then it will show you 
an error message with some uh, valid examples. So AP down example, AP flap example, border DHCP example, device unreachable. So I could say dash dash event, and then I could say device unreachable example, and that would send it a sample event for device unreachable to the test server. And you'll notice that that's um, been been handled. So I dump out the the payload, so you can see the payload that's been sent through, and then this is the message that is going to be sent. So gives me some suggested actions, and it sent an email, but it is also hopefully um, sent an alert. So you notice that I actually have an alert at 140, which has just come through, device unreachable, the suggested actions, um, verify the ports on the controller, etc. So this is an example of just sending it to um, Teams. It's also gone to Gmail, could go anywhere, you could do whatever you like with it, but the webhook um, has, server has just taken that event and then it's just pushed it out to um, other places. So very easy, very simple, um, actually not that many lines of code and that again is um, is available on GitHub. So I'm just using Flask, It's uh, as I said it's very basic, it's handles the event and basically just um, listens, takes the event, handles it, and then sends it out to um, WebEx or email, uh, Gmail in this case. So I've given you an example. Um, you can do what you like with that, but that's just a very simple way of, of getting started with events. So I think we've covered most of this. And we've given the example of um, sending out to email. So the the final thing I wanted to to cover was um, automation because you know once you've realized that there's something going on on the network, the next thing you likely to do is to want to make some changes. Um, you can use Command Runner to to make some changes, but if you want to make uh, template based changes or configuration changes, then you can use the the template programmer to, to do those. So this is, um, again, a little script that I have published. Um, it's a script called template. Uh, if you just run it by itself, essentially what it does is it connects to the DNAC and it gives you a list of templates. Templates are um, organized in folders. So if I look at uh, DNAC and I look at the template editor, I will see that there are always more than one folder. There is the onboarding configuration, which is for day zero. Those templates work slightly differently. Um, and then there is the day end templates, which I can use at any time via the API. So the one that I was just looking at was something called interface list. This is velocity template. Um, in the near future, we'll be adding um, ginger templates as well. But today we have velocity. And essentially what this is doing is it's a for each, so it's looping through a, a list and it is um, for each interface in that list, it is defining a description. So this is a very simple example of passing a list of dictionaries in. A dictionary has an interface name and a description and it's going to apply the description to the interface. So it's essentially a pair uh, tuples that are going to be sent through that um, uh, will be implemented onto the network. So the reason I did that is it's a very simple example of a, a, a loop and it's often something that people want to do. They want to configure multiple ports and it just shows you how you can do that. So if I look at the template, um, Adam slash interface dash list. This shows you, again, it shows you the API calls. Um, this is educational as much as anything else. Um, so it's doing a search. It's showing me the API call. It says that there's two versions. Um, and that's the other thing you need to be careful of. If you're to make a change here, um, you save it, but it's actually a two-stage commit. So unless you actually commit it, it won't get used. So you need to commit it so that the latest version gets used. 
Um, you can do some funky things with variables. Um, you don't need to that much if you're um, if you're using the uh, the API. Um, the only thing I would say you need to be careful of is you can do um, for loops that loop through stacks. That's some other examples that I have. And if you do that, you probably need to type them as an int. So that's the only thing you need to be careful of is that you probably need to type the, the variable for stack count as an int um, as opposed to a, a, um, a, a string. Um, anyway, so what this tells me is the, it shows me the body. So this is the body of the template. And then it says that it needs a, one parameter. So there's this variable called interface description list. Now it hasn't told me much about that. Um, I can infer from this that it's actually going to be a list of dictionaries with int and desk. So interface and description. And here's an example of one that I prepared earlier. So, so gigabit one slash zero slash 10 is going to be f one. And, and 11 is going to be two. So that's going to be passed in, it's going to loop through, and it's going to apply the configuration to them. So I know you're not going to believe me. Um, this is another cool thing that we've just added in 1.3. You can click on a device now. Um, in the inventory. I'll just shut this. And if I click on this device, I can actually run commands directly on it. So that was something that I wasn't able to do before. And then I can also make it go into um, full screen mode. And I can do a show run in gig one such show such 10. And you should be able to see that the previous config first was applied. So if I go and apply this template, um, you notice that it's used version three because I committed it. Um, it's showing me the parameters that it sent through. It's it then gets a deployment ID. So this is an asynchronous template um, API call. It's going to poll that API uh, that that deployment task until it's completed. When it's completed, it gives me the start and the end time, and I can see that this was successful. Um, it took one second and it finished comp the provisioning. So if I have a look at the, um, the interface now from DNAC, you can see that, that that got updated and so did 11. So that's a very simple way of using the template programmer APIs um, just to show you how easy it is to do. Um, of course, you could integrate this very easily into a Sparkbot. Um, this is a, again another little example of a Sparkbot. So it runs um, a bunch of different commands. I can do things like command runner. I can do things like path trace. I could do things like template programmer if I wanted to. So between these two little bots, I could you know get um, information that's coming in, and then I would have the ability to make change. And if I wanted to combine the two in the same window, I could do that. I've just separated them out for the, the purpose of uh, simplicity. Okay, so one more thing that I wanted to cover on the template programmer API. If I run that again, I'm going to expect that this will fail. Now you're probably wondering why I know that it's going to fail. And the reason that it says that it's already deployed with the same parameters. So DNAC tries to be clever about templates. And if you deploy the same template with the same parameter, it's not going to redeploy it. Now, there's two ways you can solve this. I could change one of the variables. I could have a dummy variable, or I could just run it with the dash dash force option, which is going to force the template to be applied anyway. And there'll be a very subtle difference in the payload that gets used. So you see that that actually got um, deployed, but you'll notice that there's this thing called force, force push template that's set to true. 
and that was um, set as a result of providing that parameter. So that's uh, an example of um, how you can um, do things to the API that can't necessarily do you uh, do using the UI. Uh, in terms of templates, they need to be versioned. I mentioned that you need to save and you commit. There are APIs for that. Um, and I've got some examples of how you can do that. Um, I mentioned the semantics of force push. So the default is not to reapply a template with the same variables to the same device. Um, the default provisioning behavior is to, to apply a, a single or nested template to the device. Um, if you use provisioning, then it will also um, apply the site-specific settings. So if I use the provisioning workflow where I go and provision a device, then templates get assigned to profiles. There's a whole lot more stuff that goes on. This is, the API is far more simplistic. It just pushes the things that I, I have in the template. And you can do multiple devices at a time. So if you look at the payload, it is actually a list of device targets that you send it and parameters. So I, the target info is in fact a list and I could have multiple in here if I wanted to. So I could send the same thing or send things to, to same template to multiple devices, each with different parameters and they would be executed at the same time. Uh, just a little summary of the template APIs because uh, lots of questions around that. Okay, so what did we cover? Um, we spoke about DNAC platform, how you set it up, how you configure it. We gave you some examples of getting started around authentication, um, exploring the APIs. Gave you some examples of types of applications around assurance and events and also uh, template programmer. And then in terms of next steps, there is one more thing that's coming. So in the next week or so, well, actually it's Cisco Live, it's two weeks, um, we're going to be announcing an SDK, uh, which is great news because I've been reluctant to publish too much sample code without an SDK because it's really just, I've been waiting for an abstraction to, to publish more code that just simplifies the way that you call APIs because you know REST endpoints are interesting, but it's much simpler just to interact with some sort of um, Python object rather than a, a raw REST API endpoint. So we will have an SDK, um, which is fantastic. So that will simplify a lot of this even further. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Um, and in terms of the call to action and using code exchange, I encourage you all when the SDK comes out to have a look at maybe some of the code that's on code exchange that hasn't used the SDK maybe have a crack at, at converting it. Um, maybe look at using the SDK to access some of the information around DNA Center, some of the assurance APIs, um, if you want to. And then the other thing you may want to do is to have a look at the, um, the event webhooks and have a look at how you might try and automate um, an escalation process where DNA Center uh, detects some sort of event in the network and how you might um, come up with a mechanism for, for escalation on top of that. So as I said, there is a whole lot of resources. Um, the REST APIs are documented. Um, I've got a blog series that I've been writing over the last couple of years around using the APIs. So a lot of the basic things that I've covered are, are covered in those, uh, those blogs. There's learning labs, there's sandboxes, so sandbox DNAC, uh, and then all of the things that I spoke to you about, the um, template program assurance and platform are there. There's also onboarding tools for those of you who are interested in um, plug and play. Um, a lot of people are using the plug and play APIs. I haven't covered that in this um, episode, but there's a lot of people using the plug and play APIs for, for day zero automation. With that, I think we are at the end of the session. I wanted to thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you found this useful. Um, Please stay in touch. Uh, these are my contact details. I'm at just about every Cisco Live. Um, also hang out on the, the forums and, and try and help out where, wherever I can. So always keen to, to help people around using the APIs. With that, thank you very much um, and good evening, good day, or good afternoon, wherever you are. 
Great. Thanks so much, Adam. A wonderful review of the application policies and capabilities that we have with DNA Center. And it's a great way to kind of kick off our uh, entrance into the SDK that is coming and announced upcoming at Cisco Live. So keep your eyes open for those. With that, thank you all for joining us today. And we will see you next week for NetDevOps Live. Thanks. Thanks.